Putting on my top hat, tying up my white tie, brushing up my tail. Welcome to Hatcast, the podcast about hats. I'm Charles Berman. And I'm Carl Bernhardson. And we're here to talk about hats. That is correct. We've got quite a program for you, ladies and gentlemen. We have some very, very exciting personal hat acquisition news. Oh, yes. Uh, and from both ends of us. Really? I think yours is more impressive than mine. But we will. So who should we start with? Well, let's start with you. All right. Sometimes, uh, I, will admit, I won't call it a guilty pleasure because I don't actually experience any guilt as a result of it. <laughs> I like to go to the Salvation Army and look through their bins of dollar baseball caps so a pastime yes i went today and sometimes you find very eccentric <laughs> well a lot of odd... baseball caps get printed with strange things on them yes or very specific things or 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 things that are that only apply to a particular time and place things that are strange taken out of context right and it's funny to think that something that could be strange and taken out of context is exactly the sort of thing that people want to emblazon on their forehead. Yes, and so sometimes I like to wear odd baseball caps that I've got for a dollar from a thrift shop, and I don't know why exactly they were made or what was their original context. I have one, for instance, that is a tan-colored cap that says in very large block letters, Human Resources. <laughs> That's pretty great. I, I have a I have one that says National Train Day 2010. Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> that's very relevant to one day <laughs> eight years ago <laughs> that most people at the time did not note. But today I wore a hat that I got earlier today oh, at the thrift shop. Yes, uh, and on, on the front it says New York State Assembly, and it has emblazoned proudly. The New York State coat of arms with it, the motto at the bottom, Excelsior. It is, it's a well-made embroidered hat. It is. You can see the elements of the coat of arms pretty clearly. What? We've got Justice in yellow with her scales. We've got Liberty. You, can, you can't you can really tell it's a Liberty cap. Not, not in any significant way. No. Although that does make it a hat with another hat on it. Uh, and that is... a pretty great thing and actually looking back i'm realizing two of the hats that i got today were hats with a hat on them really because one of the other ones was a hat of the elmira new york baseball team the elmira pioneers who play in the new york i believe it's called the new york the perfect game collegiate baseball league it's a very small league of college level players playing in the, the town of Elmira, not too far from here. Right. It's a fantastic experience if you like baseball to go. And they play in a stadium built in the 1930s, and their emblem on this particular hat was a letter P with a coonskin cap hanging off of it. So is the letter P wearing a hat? Yes. On a hat? Yes. Now, this is a call out to our listeners. I want to find how many hats deep we can get on a hat. Oh, yeah. But I, wa I wonder if you can find a hat with someone depicted wearing a hat with some sort of depiction of a hat or hat wearing on that person. Now, that seems like it's a little too detailed for most hats. Yes. But if if it's out there, I want to know about it. But please, yes. Please, yes. If you find a hat with two levels of hat wearing depicted on the hat, let us know. Maybe send a photo of yourself wearing it. And for extra points, send us one. But that's only if you want extra points. Right. On the back of this hat, it says... 2011 Finch Golf Tournament. Oh. I don't play golf, and I certainly wasn't playing in this tournament seven years ago. <laughs> and I, I suppose there must have been a team from the New York State Assembly playing in the golf tournament. Right. There, I, I'm trying to remember if there is or was. I think there was an assembly member named Finch who must oh. have had a golf tournament. Although, although maybe that's not true. Either way, it's pretty impressive to find a hat that says New York State Assembly on it. It seems interesting to get a hat so associated with a, you know, very high-level government organization, too. Yes. But I don't know if wearing this people will think I'm a member. I don't No, I don't. Really I doubt they that. would think you're a member. They might think that you are a staff member, or right, at or some point been. were a staff yeah. member. Yeah. 
But I could just be an enthusiastic supporter of the New York State Assembly. I could just be a... I'm sorry, that was... Um, I was uh, drinking some of my orange soda here, and that was a, a very, very implausible thing <laughs> I just heard. <laughs> well, <laughs> we were... <laughs> It could be that I'm just a very civic-minded resident of the state of New York who wants to show that by representing the popular government of my state on my head. This is true. This uh, could be the case. Yeah, and the other hat I bought today for a dollar, 99 cents more accurately, was a Diet Coke hat. <laughs> I don't know really why I bought it, but <laughs> I just wonder about the story. of Because you never... They, they also had a Miller Lite hat that I didn't buy. I, I, I wonder where the origin of it is. You don't hear about soda and beer beverages offering hat promotions. No, oftentimes, though, they'll... I mean, it could be for someone who works for Coca-Cola. Yeah. It could be that they have their staff wear these hats. I've definitely seen a Pepsi hat before. And there are prizes. I think that there are reward systems where you can enter in codes from... Box tops and bottles and cans right, and things. Right, it might have been that. And it could be, a, it could have been a prize from that. There was a oh, my Coke rewards, I think. You might have, someone might have bought it at the Coca Cola headquarters or factory tour mm -hmm. or something like that. I don't know what the story is, but it's it's fun. I one point I can't find it. I must have disposed of it or lost it somehow. I had a CNN baseball cap. It was just red with CNN logo and black letters on it, and. I think I was actually, this is bringing in a small dash of humor, but also grimness, because I think I happened to be wearing it on the same day there was a mad gunman at the Binghamton Civic Association. Oh, were you mistaken for press? I didn't end up going, but I almost went, and I thought if I went, I would have been, everyone would have thought I was with CNN, and I realized... Right. I could Chicago. just, if I wore this hat and there was anything newsworthy going on, I I would be mistaken for being with CNN. Yeah, that does, um, that is, that's one of the, you know, sort of magical powers of a hat, right? People will immediately assume things about you. Right, a CNN hat will, right. depending on context, could give the impression that you're with CNN, but I'm sure you could just buy it from the CNN tour gift shop, which I expect this is where this hat came from. Yeah, yeah the whole, whole notion of, of logos on clothing and being worn by people who are not necessar necessarily associated with that company or organization. It's, I mean, it's very common, but it's not, it can be misleading and yeah, confusing. It can. And at the same time, I'm a bit discomforted by it when I think about it. But the other time, sometimes for silly effect, I like to do it. Like the Diet Coke hat or the <laughs> New York State yes. Assembly hat. <laughs> I, I could just be a big New York State Assembly fan. Well, that's enough about my hats of the day. Let's get to your hat of the day. Well, today I wore... A much objectively better hat, I, I think. It's a fantastic hat. This I see myself getting a lot of wear out of this hat. I think it's one of the most beautiful objects it's in my possession. It's a glorious hat. Let's tell the people about it. First of all, it's a checked tweed hat. Yes. It has uh, both a front and a back brim. And it's it's got an all around brim, but the brim is broken intentionally in the middle. Yes, so that it folds in half. Yes, it's I. Th my initial thought was that it is a deerstalker without the flaps, but Charles did point out that a deerstalker wouldn't have the brim on the sides in the way that this yeah, one does. Yeah, it's 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 deerstalker related, but I don't think it's actually a traditional deerstalker because it well it's got panels. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six panels on the crown. And it's got the button on top that you would find on a deerstalker. Yes. The same as you would find yeah. on a... You would often find it on a deerstalker. I, I don't remember if my my deerstalker has one. We'll save that. We, we plan on doing the deerstalker episode pretty soon. Pretty soon, soon yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do some research there. It's oh. a seven and three eighths. Yes. And it has a fantastic tag on the inside, uh, which looks like the flag of Scotland. Yes. Um, St. Andrew's Cross. And... It says, a Ross product made in Scotland. Uh, and that is the only marking on the inside. It doesn't give you any information about the material. Although I would be shocked if it wasn't wool. It looks and feels like wool. It is almost certainly wool. Um, it's it's different shades of brown in yes. the check. And it has sort of an olive green 
Um, but it's very portable and very good looking hat. Yes. It's lined. Ha- having a nice hat with a good brim that you can uh, pack away and carry yes. with you is such a handy thing. You could put that, I I think, in an overcoat pocket. Yes. And I, uh, I this this hat came into my possession just uh, yesterday, just yesterday evening. Um, an employer at a store where I work uh, found out that we were doing a program on hats and that I was a hat enthusiast and let me know that he was also a hat enthusiast and had brought me both this uh, wonderful, difficult to define, but beautiful hat and another rarity, which is probably the strangest but most wonderful hat I've ever seen. It is an olive green corduroy pith helmet. It's incredible. It it, lo- it actually looks good. It's got some sort of... I, I'm looking at it across the room. Here, I'll... I have gone across the room and returned with the hat. Uh, yeah, it has some sort of badge on it with... Uh, I can't really make... It's a, it's a star. Um, and I can't really make out what other logos are on that star. Uh, like a ten-pointed star. Well, it's got two crowns and a lion. Okay, so definitely something uh, aiming at, you know, a, a British look. I wonder where your employer got this. I, I, I uh, he said it was given to him by a friend. Incredible. So, yeah. And well, uh, he said it was one of the strangest hats he's found. It certainly is. I, and wanted, I wanted to show it to me. And I, I was I was uh, happy to see them. And then uh, even happier when he said, well, if, if you want them, uh, you can have them. I've never seen a corduroy pith helmet. No, neither have I. Before that. Um, and when, uh, I mean, pith helmets have sort of gone past just being made of pith. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got a whole wide variety of materials for them. I've seen a lot of uh, sort of uh, wicker ones yeah. and uh, canvas. But, yeah, no, this is fantastic. It even has uh, a wonderful band in the same corduroy material around it, folded in, in, a, in a really, really sharp way. No, this is, I mean, this is fantastic. It is. Um, so that's that's my good fortune, uh, and my uh, wonderful bounty of hats. So well, let's get b- before we get even to the question of the day. We'll get to old business. Oh, which we had an email. Did we? It says, "Good morning." I was wondering. This is related to last episode. I was wondering if you think there's any association between the wide awake political group and their hats, and the modern usage of woke for political awakening, especially to the matters of injustice. To my knowledge, woke came into broad usage in the civil rights era of the 1960s, starting in black communities. John McWhorter on Lexicon Valley cited a New York Times article of the 1960s and has now made the jump into the broader American lexicon. You mentioned the party chose the hat, possibly for the association with the Quakers and the larger abolitionist movement, and they would be particularly awakened to racial injustices given their political bent. I'm just curious if there's any relation. Possibly. It's possible. It sounds reasonable. Um, Although the wide awake hat had been out of fashion for a good 60 years by the time. It's probably not related to the hat itself. Right. Oh, but the wide awake, um, the the, the, the branch of abolitionists, the militant abolitionists. The wide awakes. Yes, the wide awakes. They were awakened. That is true. I, I would have to do more digging to... Now, we're jumping about 100 years. Right, but 100 but... years is not so far right. away. Right. And related causes, too. So I, I I wouldn't be shocked to find some kind of... I'm curious, too. So we're going to have to do some more research yeah. and, and do more updates. We'll get back to you on that. It's nice to see a dialogue forming between, oh, yes. between uh, the program and the listeners. We have actually found an, a photo. I also found a photograph of a wide awake hat, which this is a Alfred Lord Tennyson wearing one. Oh, it and looks I very think sharp it show uh, it shows it's very broad brimmed and not quite as floppy looking as I imagine, but it could be floppy. Yeah, I, I get the impression that they, it's that kind of felt that is, um, m- sort of malleable, right? You could probably yeah. Put it into a position that you want it. Almost the crushable ones. And, right. Uh, Historical Emporium, which is a store that sells some good things, is selling what they call a Montana open crown hat. Which looks a lot like a wide awake hat, but with a slightly taller crown than I would expect. Yeah. But it looks pretty close to what Tennyson's wearing, although their hat brim is not turned up at the sides the way Tennyson's is. Right. 
It says, the wide, flat brim of our Montana hat will keep the sun off your face when out working or lollygagging under blue skies. Or in other circumstances, I imagine. Right. <laughs> a variation of the wide-awake and Quaker hats worn ah. by men in the 19th century. This is a favorite from the annals of hat history. And they're charging $78.95. Which doesn't seem unreasonable. It's not unreasonable. It, it is a pretty high amount to casually spend on a hat. Yes. But yes. it's not unreasonable for a nice hat. But... Let's put away the wide awakes for now. We'll do more research on that question of whether it could be related to the term woke, wide awake and woke. The the words are clearly etymologically right. uh, very related, but whether those uh, whether it was an actual connection between related. the two. Yes. Let's talk about the hat of today. Well, that's let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Well, let's talk about the subject of the today. The subject of today because I'm not convinced that it's a hat. We're going to talk about something which some people would not call a hat and some people would. A little bit of conflict. Yeah, and I think it's all right to talk about these things. Oh, I think so. And I, I think it'll make for uh, good discussion, at least, to have a little bit of disagreement. Yeah, and I think the word hat can represent different things at different times. Not, right. not all things are always a hat or not a hat. Right. For instance, here is the hat that I wore today. I could unravel it, and it would be a pile of thread. Would it still be a hat? No, not really, but it would be the same object. I think that's a little extreme, Charles. I think I think we're talking <laughs> about things that you put on your head that haven't been altered since they've been put on your head or designed to be put on your it, head. Yeah. If uh, you had a doll with a small object designed to represent a hat for the doll, you could say put the hat on the doll. Right. But you wouldn't say that is a hat. Correct. Yeah. So things vary, but I, I, I think I would say this is a hat. And yeah, in today's case, it is. I, I definitely say it's headgear. Yes. Right. It is. It's something you put on your head. And I know this is program isn't called headgear cast. Right. But, but a, a hat is a type of headgear. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's the balaclava, also known as, according to Wikipedia, a balaclava helmet or a ski mask. Would you describe a balaclava for the listener? It is a knitted object it covers the head and it usually has also an ability to cover the rest of the face and usually goes down as well and covers the neck so it covers the so it it fulfills the function of a hat and a scarf at the same time mm -hmm. and a pretty nicely woolly scarf that, that covers the face as well mm -hmm. This shows an image of somebody wearing a balaclava in... Oh, and it usually has holes. Yes. Or... It seems like it could either have one large hole for the entire face, uh -huh. or three, uh, for the uh, one for the eyes... Not one for the eyes, I'm sorry. Uh, two for the eyes and one for the mouth. Right. I have a balaclava. It's a little unusual one in that it's not made of the traditional knitted wool. What is it made of? It's, I guess, what you would call... And I, there's a little bit of ambiguity around this word. It's a synthetic material that gets called fleece. Okay. But it's not a fleece. Right. In the sense of okay. being from an animal. And it has, it's in, it, it covers the head and the sides, it covers the top and the sides of the head and has a piece in front that can be moved up and down that you can expand it and it will cover over your mouth up to your eyes or you can pull it down so that it no longer covers your mouth. Interesting. And it is very useful for very, very cold days, as we've had some of here mm -hmm. this year. I got it as a gift. Maybe if I'd bought it myself, I would have picked out the knitted one. Right. But it's still, it's very useful to have. I mean, it's, it seems like a very practical item in, in cold weather. Yes. Right. And the, the picture here shows this person wearing it for... Five different ways. Yeah, I, I guess I had I hadn't realized how versatile the balaclava was. Um, there's some of these images which look very much like it is, in fact, just a hat. Uh, it, I'd say some of them look like a scarf, and some of them look like somewhere in between, um, and some of them are both all at once. Uh, it really is pretty interesting i hadn't thought of all the ways you could wear one yeah and i th i would say as long as it's covering your head it's functioning as a hat that's true you can i i would i would be happy to say that a balaclava can be worn as a hat uh-huh it can also be worn as a scarf and it yes. can be worn as a 
headgear which serves as both uh, hat and scarf. Right. I, I'm I'm willing to make right. that statement. So this guy is wearing in the photo is wearing a balaclava over just the head portion, the over just the crown of his head. Right. And in that case it looks just like a normal Nick cap. watch cap. Yeah. Yes. Would you say when it's being worn the typical manner covering the face that it is functioning as a hat? Parts of it are functioning as a hat. So the person is wearing a hat. They are wearing a hat. Yeah. They're wearing a hat which is connected to other things. And I guess, I yeah, I, I, I would have to call it a hat. Because if you think about like the, um, think about the Ushanka. Yes. Right? Uh, if you tie the two flaps together, um, it's pretty much the same shape as the balaclava. Mm-hmm. Well, I was hoping for a little bit more of a spirited debate, but I, no, I, I guess kind you... of crumbled here and well, come to agree that it is a hat. I, but... I think, well, if you're out there, well, we'll, we'll have more things that might foster disagreement in the future. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, but if you're out there and you have a strong view that the balaclava cannot be a hat. Uh, let us know. Yeah. Write to us. At, and uh... We'll engage. Yeah. Hatcast at Yandex.com. We'll engage in that debate. It says here, traditional balaclavas were knitted from wool. Modern versions are also made from silk, cotton, polypropylene, neoprene, acrylic, or polar fleece. Which would be yours. Yes. This type of headgear was known in the 19th century as an Uhlan cap or a Templar cap. And it says in the book, Hats and, Headwear, Hats and Headgear Around the World, a Cultural Encyclopedia, the hood cape as a functional head covering was reintroduced and patented as the protector in the mid-19th century by James Martin of Walworth, Greater London, England. Adopted by military units, it was worn by British troops during the Crimean War, a conflict, to be, a conflict believed to be the first in which knitted items were made in the home country for use abroad by fighting forces. Huh. Although the name Balaclava was derived from and associated with the battle site, it did not appear in print until the 1880s. So it's named after the Battle of Balaclava. Yes, in the okay. Crimean War. Because it was very much associated with the Crimean War in the public imagination because many people at home were knitting balaclavas to send the soldiers because in Crimea in the wintertime it can get very cold. So it is, so it's it's a, essentially a British invention. Yes. Based on sort of a remembering of medieval uh, military headgear, Well, there, there have all been, always been uh, head coverings that have, for warm weather, so I think... Cold weather. Yeah. It, it says here the balaclava's historical roots are traced to 12th century Europe when the typical masculine head covering was a hood attached to a cape. In later styles, the hood was detached as an independent head covering and subsequently changed into a neck cape. Two centuries thereafter, a long band, cornet or lyripipe... What's a lyripipe? Cornet or lyripipe, which hung down in back to, or to one side, was added... This evolved hooded cape was composed of two parts, the neck protector and the opening around the face. The hood could be worn pulled forward, obscuring the wearer's face, or draped to the back, uncovering the head. Huh. Over the next several centuries, the hood cape developed into several fashionable shapes of hats, including a rolled padded head ring and wrapped turban-like headdress. Huh. We are going to have to, at some point, uh, dive into historical hats that we're not going to see in the wild. Oh well, we yeah, probably def- we we will almost certainly be able to find uh, in paintings uh, and sculpture certainly that we can reference, and that's almost the case with the wide awake, which was very popular in not too distant history, and now is just not seen really. Right, but we'll have to go back to medieval hats, Roman hats. I mean, it's, 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 it really a whole is endless. human history of hats. This show can go on and on and on and on. Oh, yes. And I also thought we should do an episode, and this might occasion more debate, on the hood. Yeah, I agree. I think we should do it. The hood is pretty timeless. It's been on garments for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It covers the head, covers the ears. But it's connected to some other garment. But, uh, you know, that's uh, the balaclava is, in a lot of ways, a type of hood. It is adopted from the hood. It says here, similarly styled head coverings were also referred to to by various names one was the uhlan cap from the turkish oglan meaning a young man and wore by members of the polish and prussian militaries 
Another was the Templar cap used by outdoor sporting enthusiasts. Interesting. Just as a way to keep warm while sporting? I imagine so. Huh. In Spain, a later woolen virgin that emerged was dubbed Pasa Montaña, or Mountain Pass in English. So how how quickly did the balaclava go from being just associated with the Crimean War to being worn widely up, all throughout the world? I am getting the impression that once it... Well, the British Empire spanned a great deal of the world at this That's time. That's true. So once they got their hands on something, it was going to be able to be spread very quickly yes. to everywhere. And the fact is, because of that, although we have much faster communication now, world culture still... There was much more world culture than one might imagine. The balaclava, I, I imagine, traveled pretty fast. Well, one of, one of the statistics that's always stuck in my mind is that um, in 19... World trade was at its highest... In 1914, uh, up until some point in the 70s, because of the two world wars and then the Soviet Union and various communist states sort of closing themselves off to trade. Oh, really? Yep. Uh, and so there was an awful lot of intera international interaction, both sort of voluntary uh, commercial interaction and involuntary uh, imperial action. But th things did move very quickly across the globe. I think because these became well-known items, they probably were worn pretty broadly, especially as they were associated with the military. Right. Yeah, and that's that's true. Military association really, really can make something popular quick. Did they have a role in uh, World War One and World War Two? Well, he says here in Hats, a history of fashion and headgear by Hilda Amflet. At the outbreak of the First World War, the peaked cap proved a light and practical form of headwear for all ranks, but under shell fire, the metal helmet or tin hat protected the head against shrapnel. It varied in shape among the warring nations and in some cases was worn over a head-hugging woolen cap, first designed for the Crimean War in 1851, known familiarly as the balaclava helmet or simply balaclava. Okay, so you, you would wear it under your metal helmet. Yes. I guess that would make it, that would make wearing the helmet more comfortable. And keep you warm. Right. So it's a very practical headgear, especially for battle in cold areas, which which was an element of both the First World War and the Crimean War. It looks like references to the balaclava helmet, as they called it, really picked up starting around World War One when it was worn under those helmets and became popular there. But also the fact that it's called a balaclava helmet calls back to its use during... The Crimean. The Crimean War. Huh. Something we should mention about balaclavas is that they're also associated not just with soldiers or people who are outside in the cold. They're also associated, well, they're also associated with skiers. Skiing, very, and, very, yeah, very strongly associated with they're skiing. They're often called a ski cap or a right. ski mask. I had, I had known them as a ski mask. And in fact, when you had initially started talking about balaclavas, I wasn't really sure what you meant. So I was happy to learn. Uh, more about the object that I had always known as a ski mask. Do you have a ski mask or a balaclava? Uh, I don't at this time. I'm remembering back. I think that I had one as a child that I would wear when I would go to play in the snow. Um, but I think it was the kind with three holes, which seems a little bit less traditional. Um, but well, it's fairly traditional. A little. It's a little less versatile, though, because you can't really wear it as a scarf or... You could wear it as just a hat. But it but does you cover your neck. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but what else is it associated with, apart from skiing and the military? Here's a book called First Call, Guidepost to Berlin by Arthur Guy Empry from 1918. Arthur Guy Empry says, The balaclava helmet is very comfortable in wintertime, especially when wearing the tin hat or steel helmet. It consists of a woolen headpiece covering the top of the head, ears, back of neck, cheeks, and front of neck. The neck piece should be long enough to go well below the collar of the blouse. There should be strings to tie below the chin. Which you don't often see these days. No, you don't really see the strings anymore. Well, mine does have one, actually. but it, oh. So you do see it. But <laughs> My not, balaclava has the strings. Does it's yours? Just, it, it, it has one of those little plastic toggles, which I'm sure you wouldn't see in the 1910s. It's also associated with criminals. Right. Oh, right. As a, a bank robber might wear. Yes. Okay, I see. 
Uh, yeah, it, it would be a good way to hide your identity. Yes. Um, to prevent people from knowing who you were by seeing your face. Preventing one from being photographed in the act of a crime. It's a little cliche. Do do a lot of criminals... I, will, I wonder what percentage of criminals actually wear a balaclava. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I think if you just are looking for a quick mask... Right. And I, I guess what percentage of criminals, obviously like white-collar criminals uh, committing fraud, are not... <laughs> Showing up to work one day wearing a balaclava no. <laughs> and sitting down and doctoring the books. I, I sort of meant, um, rob by criminals, I meant what percentage of, like, public robberies. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, I, There's no way of, of yeah. knowing that. but you, you see it a lot on television, but I don't yeah. know. Popular I, I imagine TV. a lot of criminals do it just to copy television, too. That's true. They see it on TV. They think, well, that's they what need I need to do when I go mask. to rob the, the place. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you are wearing a balaclava in the cold, it is a perfectly reasonable, normal-looking thing. If it's summer and you're walking down the street wearing a balaclava... Right. I, I certainly wouldn't, one, walk down the street in the summer wearing a balaclava. Two, be walk down warm. the street and walk into a bank wearing a balaclava. So it feels like a good way to have the silent alarm immediately triggered. Yes, I mean, that, that would be... <laughs> uh, the, the magician Teller is, I believe, fascinated with the idea of lying without speaking and i think that would be a good example yes because you haven't really done anything wrong you've just chosen an unusual piece of headwear that s signals an intent yes right <laughs> it, it, but it might not you might just be crazy it throw yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe maybe you just really like your face to be very sweaty in the summer you might just be testing social rules <laughs> like are they going to call the cops just based on your hat when you haven't actually made a threat. Although I will say, people are made generally uncomfortable when people are covering their faces in settings where the face is generally not yes. covered. Right? That sort of... Uh... When I was a child, I went to the Halloween store. <laughs> was this around Halloween or was this... In, I... <laughs> it, it was around Halloween. It, it was selling Halloween costumes with my mother. And she... And I bought a... It wasn't a balaclava, but it was... A fake Jack the Ripper hood. Okay. Where... Does anyone... No one really knows what Jack the Ripper wore. Oh, not Jack the Ripper. <laughs> uh, what's he called? Grim Reaper. Oh, gr oh, those are two very different... One is, well, one of those <laughs> is a real person. The other is sort of a historical representation I, of death. I just misspoke. It was <laughs> a Grim Reaper hood. <laughs> and it was a hood that covered your head. And in front of it was a, a piece of dark fabric that covered the front of your face right so you could see in you could see or, out oh, sorry, but you could see up, but when people see were in. looking at you it just looked like a blackness and i was very excited about it and wanted to wear it home <laughs> in the car and my mother kept saying to take it off and she wasn't explaining why and i just got very impatient and i i realized later it's because it could have looked like i was a criminal Potentially, uh, yes. Yeah. Or uh, uh, just trying to frighten someone wearing a Halloween mask. Uh, <laughs> it could have looked like I was a, a criminal hijacking the car. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, the context makes a difference. It's also associated with Pussy Riot. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. Are they a, They're a Russian protest band, yes? They are, yes. And they wear brightly colored balaclavas. They're sort of anti-Putin for the most part. Yes, and they were they were in prison for a while, right? They the three main ones, two of the three main ones were in prison for a while. Now, do they wear the balaclavas to hide their identities, or I guess their identities are known if they were successfully imprisoned? I think it might. Well, the membership changes. Okay. The three main ones who were charged were charged by they were technically charged with hooliganism, but basically they performed a sacrilegious performance in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior right. in Moscow in 2012. And this was considered to be outrageous by the Russian Orthodox Church, which mm -hmm. is very close to Putin's government. And Russia one of them, Russia. I believe, essentially made the argument that you could see on the tape that she was still trying to get her instrument plugged in or something. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember. And so therefore... She had not actually taken part in the performance, so she couldn't be guilty. 
seems seems I, I'm not to be critical of 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 someone, but uh, seems like if you're going to actively decide to take part in a sort of protest performance, to then sort of try to weasel out of having been involved in it on a technicality, feels a little bit. Yeah, I don't think the others held it against her. Right. Yeah, they were convicted of hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. Okay. And so clearly these three wore the balaclavas in the performance, and then it became known who they were. Their faces were all over television. Mm -hmm. They've been interviewed under their real names. But I think the actual membership of Pussy Riot can change. And they're the those original three I don't think are still in it. Okay. So I think that the masks could serve to disguise the identities of current performers in it okay and they also work as a signal as a trademark because they're they're bright the photograph we're looking at now uh does have them brightly colored bright yellow bright bright green and, and right so. and one with has was a pom-pom on the top so i think it in this case it takes some of the balaclavas association with mystery with with rebelliousness mm -hmm. because of its association with crime, because a someone, a political dissident working against the government might want to be anonymous, even ones that are not anonymous could still take this symbol of anonymity yeah. and use it to show themselves right. working against the government. I see. So if you were wearing a brightly colored balaclava while performing a protest punk song, you might be seen as a member of this group. Right. Uh, an association that probably wouldn't happen here very quickly but definitely in, in i think Russia. depending on the context yeah. the, the, the the story was pretty widely heard about in the u.s i, I do like i said i remember some of the details of it so oh very interesting so i think in general if you wear a balaclava you'll be seen as very normal if you're skiing and i don't ski but i don't imagine that if i skied i would want to do it without a balaclava mm, i don't know i feel i i don't like having well you don't have to have it cover your mouth i don't like my mouth covered by fabric um mm -hmm. because i have difficulty breathing through my nose uh so that would make it harder for me to breathe but i i do i do see the appeal of it i feel like it would i don't know i feel like it would be itchy with a or difficult and get stuck in uh, a beard which i do if, wear if you have the knitted one yeah. yeah the the polar fleece one that i had did not have that problem but i could see how a knit one because i know might... i know uh, even a turtleneck uh, when I wear it, can sometimes uh, pill pretty badly on the part of my neck where the beard is, uh, just from rubbing against the hair. So I, I imagine uh, I don't, I don't think of knitwear as doing very well mm -hmm. on, on my face. <laughs> uh, I do see how it is on the whole practical. Well, of course, it is also associated with police and SWAT teams. Right. That's another association you might have. Although I think I think that fits in the sort of military realm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it says here in the Indian subcontinent. Balaclavas are commonly referred to as monkey caps because of their typical earth tone colors and the fact that they blot out most human facial features. Monkey caps sometimes have a small decorative woolen pom-pom on top. They are commonly worn by troops on Himalayan duty for protection from the cold. Interesting. So you don't think, if you're not in India, you don't think of India as being a very cold place. But it has it has a lot of... There the are Himalayas, cold regions. Yeah. Would, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're going to the Himalayas, you would need something warm. And also, the Russian Wikipedia has something that the English Wikipedia does not have. Really? This is something that can be revealed to us by our uh, Russian-speaking friend here? It has a section called Balaclava and Terrorism. Oh. Which says that it was associated with the organization Black Sen September that did the terrorist act at the Munich Olympics right. in 1972. Interesting. Well, that certainly adds another level of uh, sort of political dissident meaning for, uh, you know, any group that might wear it in Russia in particular. Well, yeah, it's, of course, this is Munich rather than right. Russia, but still, that seems to be uh, an association. Okay. And here is a uh, picture of one of the most reproduced photos taken during the siege captured a kidnapper on the balcony attached to the Munich Olympic Village, Building 31, where members of the Israeli Olympic team and delegation were quartered. And this terrorist is clearly wearing a uh, balaclava. Yep. So that's another association you might not necessarily want. Right. 
Yeah, might want to avoid that. And it says that the majority of terrorist acts of the IRA and ETA were committed wearing various balaclavas. Uh, is that... Is that true, or is that just what Russian Wikipedia tells us? I have seen images that appear to... I, I wouldn't say I've done a statistical study to say that it's the majority, right. but I have seen images you that seem to be in to alignment that. with that. Okay. and so, I, I, it, it is something that you would wear if you're trying to uh, commit some sort of act of political terror. Because and, it hides your and, face. And remain yeah. Uh, anonymous, yeah. Huh. So I think that Pussy Riot is wearing it as a nod to that, showing that they are rebellious and anti-authority. But not necessarily going to cause violence. No, I don't think that's their right. MO. Oh, very interesting. So yeah, I think the normal context is skiing, or if it's very cold, or if you're a soldier in a cold area. Right, part of very your military normal. Yeah. Uh, outfit. But also potentially criminal terrorist or political dissident. I think if you're wearing it out of context, if you're right. wearing it when it would not be normal to need the cold protection of it, mm -hmm. it can lend you the air of being a criminal. Right. <laughs> All right. So let's let's get to our ratings, shall we? Sure. Well, so we start with uh, style. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a one. Uh, it is. You either um, you are wearing this to uh, stay. Uncold, right? Yes. Uh, it is. It is not stylish. It, it might be versatile in that it can be arranged on your head or neck in a variety of ways. But I find none of those arrangements to be pleasing to the eye. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I'm going to give it a one on style. Decidedly unstylish. Yeah, I don't think it's particularly stylish. It it does have different ways you could wear it. You and they do make brightly colored ones, which could be part of a stylish get up or they could just used. be more obviously unstylish yeah. <laughs> i don't i don't think i'll give it a one that's incredibly <laughs> low maybe i'll give it a three okay uh practicality is higher oh you know what i'll walk that back a little bit 1.5 all right 1.5 practicality i'll i'll gladly give it a seven because it isn't always practical but when you need it it's exactly what you need i was actually going to give it a seven as well because it is incredibly practical in certain circumstances. In other circumstances, it could be too warm if right. it's not very cold out. Or it could cause people to panic. <laughs> yes, it, it could. <laughs> so, but I think the high practicality in other circumstances gives it a high rating. Right. So that's a total, which if we divide it by four, it comes to a total of 4.625. Pretty middling. Yeah, just, just below average, right? Yeah. So. So that's the balaclava. Overall, a good thing to exist. I might want a knitted one, if, because, again, we live in an area where it gets pretty cold sometimes. Yeah. I would consider having one. I don't have one, but uh, I, I, I have enough hats that I don't need to get something that's sort of like a hat Yeah. Um, to, to do the job. But uh, if, if, if you want one, go ahead and get one. Yeah. If you're a criminal, you might need one. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> All right, well, this has been HatCast. If you're interested in getting in touch with us, you can do so by emailing hatcast at yandex.com. That's H-A-T-C-A-S-T at Y-A-N-D-E-X dot C-O-M. We look forward to hearing from you. Goodbye. Bye. Балаклава, балаклава, город доблести и славы, уголок для многих русский украинской земли. Балаклава, балаклава, город доблести и славы, уголок для многих русский украинской земли. Крепость старая и бухта, балаклавская застава, яхты словно море чайки нос подставили волне. На набережной право разгулялась балаклава, все поет, грохочет, пляшет, как в каком-то дивном сне. А на набережной браво разгулялась балаклава, все поет, грохочет, пляшет, как в каком-то дивном сне.